And joining me now for more on all this is Joseph Costa. He is the senior associate at the Cohen Group and also the director of the Truman National Security Project's Nuclear Nonproliferation Expert Group, which is a mouthful. But Joseph, uh, give me your thoughts. Uh, the fact that U.S. Secretary John Kerry is heading to Geneva, cutting short this trip, what do you read into all of that? I think it's a very positive sign, and I'm certainly much more optimistic than I was one year ago today. What we're seeing now for the first time is tang tangible positive signals coming from both the Iranian leadership and the U.S. leadership. The fact that Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman had a bilateral conversation with Iran's Deputy Foreign Minister, it's a very positive sign, the type of thing that we've been looking for for so many years. What do you think the tipping point is on all of this? I mean, if you were to look at one thing that led to knocking all these dominoes over, what was it? I think one of the key changes has been what has happened in Iran's domestic politics. President Hassan Rouhani, the newly elected Iranian president, for many, many years, more than a decade, he has voiced a more positive and conciliatory uh, gesture towards the United States. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif, Western educated, for years now he's been writing, even in Western press, about having more normalized relations with the United States and the world is important. And if you look back at the history, President Rouhani actually was the head of nuclear negotiations in 2003 when Iran first suspended its enrichment program. These are individuals that are looking to have more normalized relations with the West, but let me add, they also will not be willing to give up Iran's core nuclear rights, and that's really where we'll have to focus on for the next round of ne negotiations. Uh, Joseph, you're one of these guys who can look in the weeds. I mean, you understand this stuff. So give us what you think the contours of a deal might look like. I mean, what are going to be the key aspects of all of this? Well, I think the first term, what we're seeing now in the press is accurate, which is this is a first phase or a first step. Confidence is really what's holding both parties back right now. So we need confidence building measures. What I hope we're going to get out of a Friday agreement is that there will be a short term freeze of certain aspects of U.S. sanctions, and we'll have a short term freeze of the most concerning parts of Iran's enrichment program, which is the 20% uh, enrichment of nuclear fuel. Once we have that, we will have the breathing room for political level individuals to then begin, have, begin to have more serious negotiations about a longer term deal. So what will that look like? We've heard indications. One, we'll have to have a much tougher verification process on the ground through the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, second, we'll have to have 24-7 inspections. Uh, we'll, most importantly, the P5 plus 1 in the international community will need to be assured that there is a significant period of time between where Iran stands now and, where it, and how long it would take if it made a political decision to acquire a nuclear weapon. You, you know, I think back to last year and Netanyahu in New York at the United Nations and that kind of cartoonish bomb. Uh, obviously, Israel not very happy about all of this. Neither right. is Saudi Arabia. Right. How does Kerry assuage these allies of the United States? How do they kind of smooth over all of this? Well, you have to look at the alternative, right? If, if we are unable to have a diplomatic resolution which perhaps constrains Iran's enrichment program and puts forth a number of mechanisms where if a political decision were made for Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon that the international community would be notified quickly, um, the alternative might be war. The alternative might be Iran with a nuclear weapon. Those are two nightmare scenarios for Israel. Those are two nightmare scenarios for uh, uh, our Gulf allies as well. Let me ask you this question. Um, time. Uh, my brother was in Vietnam. Right. My daughter went on vacation in Vietnam a couple of years ago. Time has a way of kind of changing things. Can you see a day where people are vacationing from the United States and Iran? I mean, how long before the, the, this is kind of a huge first step in many respects. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a great question because I think if you talk to the older generation of Americans, it's very difficult to imagine the, where the U.S. Uh, would have more normalized relations with Russia when we're in the heart of the Cold War. Our relations with Iran really fell after 1979. It's been 30 years, so pretty much my entire life we have had these difficulties with Iran. But I certainly can imagine a period of time where I think that relations can be improved. It will require uh, steps on both sides of the equation. Iran will have to abide by its international commitments, and it will have to restore confidence from the international community in its actual intentions in its nuclear program. It's not just about the nuclear program, though. Saudi Arabia and our other Gulf allies, what they're concerned about is Iran's meddling in the region as well. So Iran is going to have to take another, a number of steps um, where it will be more in line with the international community. 
for its part, the United States will have to show some flexibility as well, and I think we are in this case. I think the fact that we're willing to relieve some sanctions and perhaps continue to roll them back as Iran begins to show more positive gestures, I can certainly imagine in, um, in my lifetime that we can see, see each other on more normal footing. It may be a long time away, but it'll be an interesting day. Joseph Costa, thank you so much. Thank you very much.